Remember that in our general description of the 5-5 five five gun, we mentioned the breech mechanism. Let's see what this breech mechanism has to do, then how it works, and how the firing mechanism, which fits into the back of the breech mechanism, enables us to fire the gun. Here's a simplified drawing of the gun with a round loaded. When the gun is fired, the enormous force of the explosion acts equally against the base of the shell, the walls of the chamber, and backwards against the breech mechanism. This must close sufficiently tightly to withstand the force of the explosion and prevent the gases which drive the shell from escaping backwards. The breech mechanism of the 4.5 and 5.5 guns is of what is called the Asbury single motion type. You'll understand later on why it's called single motion. The breech is closed by a well-in breech screw. Let's see the principle on which this works. One way of providing a very strong means of closing the breech would be to have the inside of the breech bush prepared with screw threads and then to fit a large screw into it when we want to close the breech. But this takes a long time since it means completely rotating the screw many times to engage it fully. So the threads inside the breech bush are not continuous, but interrupted, as you see here. They correspond to similar interrupted threads on the outside of the breech screw itself. So if we push the breech screw into the breech bush with the raised threaded portions of the screw opposite to the smooth portions in the breech bush, and then turn the breech screw through one twelfth of a revolution, the threads on the screw will engage in the corresponding threads in the bush. This will not close the breech quite as strongly as if we had screw threads over the whole surface of the breech screw and breech bush, but it's very much quicker and quite strong enough for the purpose. Now let's see how the breech screw is supported and examine the mechanism which turns the screw when it is fully home in the breech bush. This red line on the screw comes opposite that one on the breech bush when the screw is completely locked. Here's the breech screw. We'll remove it to show the pintle, which is this projection on the carrier. The screw fits onto the pintle and can rotate about it. Now that the carrier has been made transparent, you can see running through it a shaft with a lock actuating cam and crosshead. Here is the lever breech mechanism, or LBM. On the breech screw itself is the crosshead boss, which will fit over the crosshead when the breech screw is in position on the pintle. The carrier, which has now become solid, is supported by two lugs on the breech ring and can pivot about a pivot pin between them. Now as the carrier is swung inwards, the breech screw enters the breech bush. When it's fully home, an upward and forward movement of the LBM causes the screw to rotate. Watch the red line on the screw. Until when the LBM is as far forward as it will go, the screw is fully locked in the threads of the breech bush. 
This time, watch how this roller engages in this rotating cam on the breech ring as the breech screw enters the breech bush. As the screw enters the breech bush, the roller runs round the curved path in the rotating cam and changes the swinging motion which closes the breech into a rotary motion to lock the screw. So you see that by a single motion of the LBM, we've closed the breech and locked the screw. With the breech screw closed again but unlocked, let's see how it's rotated and locked in the threads of the breech bush. A forward and upward movement of the LBM will rotate this shaft, which in turn will move the crosshead down. This will turn the breech screw clockwise through the amount required to engage its screw threads in those of the breech bush, actually one twelfth of a revolution. To see this happening, we'll make the LBM a glass one and look at the whole thing from the side. There she goes. To unlock the breech screw again, the LBM is moved back and down. This will move the crosshead round and upwards, which will rotate the breech screw anti-clockwise, unlocking it. Looking from the side again, let's watch the unlocking movement. As the breech screw reaches the unlocked position, the rotating cam and roller come into action again and the breech swings open. Notice that with the LBM as far forward as it'll go, the crank pin, to which the crosshead is attached, is slightly in rear of its dead centre. This means that the breech screw will not begin to unlock until the crank pin is the same distance in front of dead centre. It also ensures that if the breech screw tends to unscrew when the gun is fired, the resulting force on the crank pin will tend to press the LBM even further forward, locking the breech still more firmly. Once more, watch the whole locking movement. And now, watch the opening and closing on the gun itself. To prevent the breech from being opened accidentally, there is a catch on the LBM. This catch must be pressed down before the LBM can be pulled back and the breech screw unlocked. Watch how the catch works when the breech is closed. To stop the breech screw from rotating until it's fully home in the breech bush, and also to hold the breech mechanism in the open position, we have this control arc. This extension on the LBM comes into the control arc as soon as we start to swing the breech open. Once the extension is in the control arc, the LBM cannot be raised and so the breech screw cannot be rotated. When the breech is fully open, the toe of the extension is acted on by this spring plunger. The plunger forces the extension on the LBM out behind this shoulder, and so pushes the LBM up slightly. The breech cannot be closed again until the LBM is pressed down, forcing the plunger in, and so freeing the toe of the LBM from the shoulder and allowing it to ride back again round the control arc. The 5.5 and 4.5 guns are breech loading or BL equipments. This means that the charge, which is contained in a bag and fired by a tube, is loaded separately from the shell. One of the jobs of the breech mechanism is to form a gas-tight seal to prevent any rearward escape of gas when the gun is fired.
This sealing process is known as obcuration. Let's examine the obcurating system of the 5-5 gun. Here is the whole thing, having been removed from the breech screw. These various parts are the front ring, outer and inner rear rings, the obturating pad, to the front of which is attached a copper protecting disc, the sleeve, spring, and nut vent axial. And the vent axial itself with its mushroom head. The rear end of the vent axial is slightly enlarged to form a chamber for the tube. The opening at the front is shaped in such a way that when the mushroom head is sponged during firing, water will not run down the vent axial. The vent axial passes through the breech screw carrier, here shown as a ghost, and is secured to the pintle of the carrier by the nut, sleeve and spring. Between the front of the breech screw and the mushroom head is the obturating pad, protected by its disc and rings. Watch how all the parts fit onto the vent axial. The front ring, the obturating pad, the rear inner and outer rings, the sleeve, the spring, and the nut which screws over the vent axial and holds the spring in place. When the gun is fired, the mushroom head is forced backward slightly, compressing the pad against the front of the breech screw. This makes the pad expand outwards all round against the seating prepared for it in the chamber, and so prevents any gas from escaping round the breech screw. Let's fire the gun and see this happen. The greater the pressure on the mushroom head, the tighter will the pad press against its seating, and the more powerful will be the sealing effect. In this big close-up of one side of the pad, you can see the expansion quite clearly. What happened to the gas which went through the opening in the mushroom head and down the vent axial? Why didn't it blow the tube out backwards and so escape to the rear? Because the tube is held in position by means of this firing mechanism. When the gun is fired, gas passes down the vent from the chamber and forces the case of the tube to expand very tightly against the walls of the tube chamber, making it impossible for gas to escape between the walls of the chamber and the sides of the tube. So you see that the obturating pad and firing tube together prevent any rearward escape of gases. The firing mechanism not only holds the tube in position, but enables us to fire it and hence ignite the charge. Now let's find out how it fits onto the breech mechanism. Here is the breech mechanism without its firing mechanism. Before we fit the firing mechanism in position, we must first put on these parts, the lock actuating lever, link and slide. Moving the lever from right to left also moves the lock actuating link and slide. Watch the movement of this slot as the hand lever is moved. You will hear more about the slot in a moment. The firing mechanism consists of two main parts. The slide box, notice these interrupted collars, and the lock, PL. First, the slide box is put in position by sliding it vertically over the vent axial and then turning it clockwise to engage its interrupted collars with the corresponding collars on the vent axial. Watch again, and notice that as we turn the slide box clockwise, part of this portion here, the withdrawing lever, catches on this stop stud and prevents the slide box from turning anti-clockwise again until the lever is released by hand. The stop stud also prevents the slide box 
from being turned past the vertical position anti-clockwise. Next, on goes the lock. It is slipped into the slide box and cocked by pulling back the cocking handle, like this. Then it's forced further home in the slide box until this guide bolt is in line with this curved groove on the carrier. The guide bolt is pulled back against the pressure of its spring and the whole firing mechanism revolved so that the guide bolt travels down the groove and enters the slot in the actuating slide. Like this. The lock is closed by means of the lock hand lever, which moves the actuating slide and with it the lock. Now you know what the firing mechanism looks like, let's see how it works. First of all, we'll assemble a similar lock and slide box on our table again. Here is the slide box dismantled. This bit is the body of the slide box. These two sloping edges are the cocking slides. The first part to be put in position is the tube retainer. It's secured by means of a nut, and you'll notice that it's spring-loaded. This piece is the extractor. When it's been put in place, it is secured there by its axis pin. Now the withdrawing lever plunger and its spring are placed in this projection and fixed by their plug and pin. Although for the sake of quickness the demonstrator is not doing so here, remember that whenever you secure any part by means of a split pin, you must always open up the ends of the pin to prevent it from falling out. Finally, the withdrawing lever is put onto this stud. You remember seeing the lever when we were putting the complete slide box in position. It's secured on the stud by this collar and pin. Notice that this roller on the withdrawing lever bears against the withdrawing lever plunger. That's all there is to the slide box. Now for the lock itself. This piece is the lock frame. The first part to be fitted to the lock frame is the trigger bracket. It slips into a slot made for it in the lock frame, like this. This is the sear. Our next job is to fit into it the sear plunger and spring. The spring goes in first, followed by the plunger, which is held in place by a pin. When this has been done, the sear is put in position in the trigger bracket and secured by this axis pin. The next part to go on is this pole. Taking care that its longer arm is uppermost, the pole is placed against the sear and forced in until it can be secured by the trigger axis pin. The trigger axis pin passes through the trigger bracket and pull. You'll be lucky if you do it first time. And sticks out here. Here is the trigger itself. 
It is shaped to fit onto the trigger axis pin in such a way that turning the trigger also turns the axis pin and so makes the pole force the sear back against the pressure of the sear plunger spring. Now these trippers are positioned in the lock frame. Notice the way in which these two recesses in the trippers are pointing. Next, the guide block is placed in the recess made for it. Then the complete striker spindle is slipped into the guide block from the rear so that the firing pin at the front of the striker spindle sticks out of the front of the guide block. Over the striker spindle goes the mainspring. And over the mainspring, the mainspring case. The mainspring case screws over the threaded portion of the guide block. A special wrench is provided for tightening up the spring case and when it's been screwed right home, the spring case is prevented from rotating by a locking plate and set screw. The serrations at the edge of the locking plate engage in those round the bottom of the spring case so that the spring case cannot unscrew. Next we come to the cocking sleeve. Notice this notch on it. These two rollers are secured by their axis pins in position in the cocking sleeve. You'll see that the axis pins go in from the inside. Remember, we're only seeing how the parts of the lock fit together at the moment. We'll explain the working of the parts later on. Now the cocking sleeve is turned upside down and used like a spanner to turn this feather on the striker spindle until the slides on the trigger bracket are opposite the slides in the cocking sleeve. When the slides have been lined up, we pull back the sear by turning the trigger and so allow the cocking sleeve to be pressed home. Watch again. The sear will foul the cocking sleeve and prevent it from entering the slides unless we turn the trigger. Next, this cocking handle is screwed onto the striker spindle and secured. You can now see that the cocking handle enables the striker spindle and cocking sleeve to be drawn back against the pressure of the mainspring. The next part to go on is the guide bolt. First, this spring is pushed into it. This plug is forced in after the spring. Then the plug is rotated to engage this groove on a small stud inside the guide bolt, thus keeping the plug in position and compressing the spring. Next, the guide bolt is slipped through the hole made for it in this projection on the lock frame and secured by its retaining pin.
The lock is now completely assembled. Now let's see on this top view drawing how the firing mechanism works. First, we'll identify the various parts. Here's the cocking sleeve with its notch. The spring case, the spring, the striker spindle, the firing pin, the guide block, the sear, the pole, and below the trigger bracket, the trigger. When the cocking sleeve is drawn back, the notch on it will pass this projection on the sear. The sear plunger spring, which you can't see of course, since it's inside the body of the sear, will force the projection into the notch and hold it there. The lock is now cocked. The cocking sleeve and striker spindle cannot move forward under the action of the mainspring because the projection on the sear is caught against the rear end of the notch. To fire the gun, a lanyard is attached to the trigger. The trigger is pulled to the right, causing the pole to withdraw the sear from the notch on the cocking sleeve. Here we go. Let's cock the lock again. If the trigger is moved the other way, the pole will turn in the opposite direction. But owing to the shape of the pole, it will still force the sear out of the notch and fire the lock. Now we'll see the firing mechanism on the gun again. Here it is open. The tube is put in here and held by the tube retainer. The lock is now closed by moving the lock hand lever to the left. You can see that as the lock closes, the tube retainer is forced sideways as the guide block takes its place in holding the tube in position. Subject to the working of a safety stop, which we'll describe together with the other safety devices later, the lock can be opened by moving the lock hand lever to the right. Watch the opening again, and you'll notice how the rollers, here and here, in the cocking sleeve, ride up the cocking slides, here and here. Here we go. We'll see the movement on a top view diagram. Here's one of the rollers and one of the cocking slides. As you've just seen, when the lock is opened, the rollers ride up the cocking slides until the sear engages in the notch on the cocking sleeve and the lock is cocked. You remember that in the slide box we have an extractor whose job is to eject the spent tube from the vent after it has been fired. It does this automatically as the lock opens. If you look at this diagram, you'll see how. After firing, the tube is jammed good and tight in the tube chamber. Now the extractor must set to work and get it out. When the lock is opened, the guide block will move to the right and first make contact with the unseating lug of the extractor, here. The lug you see is inclined. So the guide block will force it forward slightly, which will cause the arms of the extractor to move slightly to the rear. This provides a short, powerful unseating movement to free the tube. As it goes still further to the right, the trippers, moving with the lock frame, will foul these lugs on the extractor and flick it round providing the sharp movement which ejects the tube as the lock comes fully open.
here we go again. Powerful unseating and quick ejecting movement. Then a new tube is inserted and prevented from falling out by the tube retainer. The lock is then closed and the guide block moves back, taking over the job of the tube retainer, which is pushed to the left. As the lock becomes fully closed, the left-hand chamfered portion of the guide block will press the extractor fully home, and the lugs will reposition the trippers, ready for the next extraction. Watch carefully. Now the whole process of closing the lock once again. Now let's see how the lock is automatically opened when the breech is opened. As the LBM is pulled back, the lock moves to the right and is cocked, as we've already seen. Watch it again. How this result was achieved is shown by this diagram. When the LBM is brought to the rear, it will rotate the lock actuating cam. The catch plunger passes through the lock hand lever here and works in the left hand cam path. Except for a short straight piece at the bottom, the path is bent to the right. So when the cam rotates, the catch plunger riding in the path is drawn to the right. Therefore, the lock hand lever and lock itself move to the right as well. Now we'll close it again and look down on the carrier to see the action of the lock actuating cam and how it works the rest of the mechanism. The LBM is pulled back and rotates the cam. The lock is now open and cocked. We'll do it again so that you can have another look. Let's close them again. This cross-connecting groove enables the lock to be opened or closed with the breech in the closed position. The catch plunger is at the foot of the left-hand cam groove. To open the lock without opening the breech, the catch on the lock hand lever is pressed, drawing the catch plunger slightly to the rear and allowing it to enter the cross-connecting groove we've just seen and to travel along it when the lock hand lever is moved to the right. The lock is now open and cocked, but the breech is still closed. This parallel cam groove enables the breech to be opened or closed with the lock in the opened position. Since the groove is straight, the catch plunger will ride round it when the cam is rotated by the LBM without altering the position of the lock. So the breech can be opened with the lock in the open position. Now watch the gun being loaded and fired and try to imagine to yourself what's going on inside the breech and firing mechanism. There are various safety devices which make it impossible for the gun to be fired until the breech is properly closed. This is a very good thing for the detachment, for as you'll see, it goes off with a hell of a bang. We can see parts of the safety devices here. The safety stop, the retracting bar, the safety cam on the breech screw. The safety devices make it impossible for the firing pin to strike the tube until the breech is properly closed. This withdrawing lever, when turned round against the withdrawing lever plunger, which is spring-loaded, will force the cocking sleeve and striker back so that the firing pin cannot reach the tube. The front arm of the withdrawing lever engages in a recess in the retracting bar in such a way that when the retracting bar is forced over to the left, the withdrawing lever holds the cocking sleeve back. Now you can see that the firing pin has been withdrawn. We'll have it back again.
Let's look at this diagram from behind and see how the retracting bar is worked. At the right end, here, is an actuating lever which can pivot about this point. A small roller is attached to the end of the actuating lever. This roller engages in this cutaway portion of the lock actuating cam. The instant the LBM begins to move back from the fully closed position, the lock actuating cam will begin to rotate and the roller will be forced up out of the cutaway portion of the cam. This will turn the actuating lever and the retracting bar will be pushed to the left. There she goes. The same action again. But this time, watch how the actuating lever as it is forced up out of the groove on the lock actuating cam, pushes the retracting bar to the left. Just once more. This time, notice that although the retracting bar moves to the left at once when the LBM is turned, the lock has not begun to open. It will only do so when the catch plunger reaches the curved portion of the left-hand cam groove. This ensures that the firing pin is withdrawn before the lock starts to move to the right. Otherwise, it would be sheared off. With the retracting bar to the right, we can't open the lock because this lug on the lock frame is fouling the withdrawing lever. When opening the breech, we've seen that the retracting bar has moved to the left automatically, but we may need to open the lock with the breech closed. This safety stop enables us to do so. Pushing it in forces the retracting bar to the left, and a twist of the safety stop, which has a spring behind it, holds it there. You can see how it works in this diagram. Pushing the safety stop in turns the actuating lever and so forces the retracting bar over to the left. Watch it again. The last safety device with which we'll deal is the safety cam on the breech screw. You can see it here. When the breech is open, it masks the retracting bar so that even if anything went wrong with the linkage, which normally works the retracting bar, it would still be unable to move to the right. When the breech is closed and the breech screw rotates, it takes with it the safety cam. When the breech is fully closed, the cam is free of the retracting bar, which can now move to the right. Now watch the breech being opened and closed again. You notice that as the breech screw starts to unlock, the safety cam begins to mask the retracting bar as soon as this has moved fully to the left. So much for the safety devices. Now finally, there is one test for the efficiency of the firing mechanism, which is the responsibility of the number one. To carry out this test, the lock is removed. It is fired to bring the firing pin forward. And you noticed that as he fired it, number one held the cocking handle to take the jar off the mechanism. It's important that at the moment of firing, the firing pin should have the correct amount of protrusion beyond the face of the guide block. If the protrusion is incorrect, misfires may occur. The protrusion is tested with a gauge number 16. Here it is. It is placed on the face of the guide block like this. The minimum gap in the gauge should foul the firing pin, and the maximum gap should clear it. If the protrusion is incorrect, the firing pin must be exchanged. In this case, protrusion is correct and the lock is replaced. Now we've finished with the breach and firing mechanism. Let's see them in action. In goes the shell. Then the charge. Number two puts a tube in the lock. The breech is closed. The lock is closed. 
Number three finishes his lay, and off she goes. Five. 